When I first started practicing, first of all, I missed the memo in law school that says you can't start your own practice the first day, so that's what I did. And when I did, uh, I went to every event that the Beverly Hills Bar had, and I, you know, I think I even went to intellectual property seminars, whatever it was, because I was looking to build a practice, and I actually built it on what now is called networking, but the word didn't exist back then, and it's all really because of the Beverly Hills Bar. So I think that it has a lot of value for the money over the years. So with that, we'll go into the various hidden assets. And the first one we're going to discuss is the Surgical Center, and Judge Richardson is going to discuss that. Thanks so much, Ira. Um, before I do, I just want to say what a pleasure it is for me to be here as well. I want to echo what Judges Roberts and Riff have said. I've really loved being in family law. I didn't know much about it before I started either, and it has been really a pleasure. And I've told people there's really not part of the job that I don't like. Um, I love my colleagues. I love the cases. I love trying to do the right thing every day. And I also have to say that the, the bench has been a really welcoming and very collegial uh, bar, um, I should say, the, the this event, for example, I was a little skeptical when I heard we were going to be meeting at a steakhouse at 8.30 in the morning, but it's been lovely. It's obviously a lovely setting to have an event, and I just want to thank uh, the bar for um, how welcoming you have been to uh, those of us new judicial officers. So with that said, um, I'll start off talking about the surgery center. Um, so the hypothetical didn't really say what kind of a business it is, but it would depend on whether or not it's a corporation or a uh, partnership. If it's an LLC or an LLP, it's going to be a different process for trying to collect a judgment. And um, essentially, if it's a corporation, then you have to bring a request for order for a turnover of the stock certificates. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go through our laundry list. Whereas if it is an LLC or an LLP, then you have to do an RFO for a charging order. And um, so there's two different mechanisms for that. All right, Ira. Uh, and also I wanted to mention that since Judge Richardson, and to my knowledge, the only exposure she's had to family law is when she got assigned to family law. And it's, it's really been a pleasure working with her on this. And hopefully she's going to stay in family law after her commitment uh, is up. That's why I'm embarrassing her into that now. Hopefully she'll stay. <laughs> And that's what Judge Riff is trying to do, is keep people here. The next is the safe deposit box. There's actually two ways to go on this. There's a, a procedure set forth in the Code of Civil Procedure about it, using the sheriff, et cetera. The other way is to apply ex parte without notice for what's called a private place order for the sheriff to go into the bank and open the safe deposit box and, and levy on the contents. Um, there are some judges who will say, well, there's no notice and opportunity to be heard. I don't want to do it on an ex-party basis. The problem is, if you give notice, the safe deposit box is not going to be there the next time around. So uh, you have to sometimes educate the judicial officer if they haven't been exposed to this kind of uh, request for relief. But um, I think if you make a good enough showing uh, with the court in a declaration saying from your client saying that, you know, the spouse used this as his personal piggy bank and at any one time there's X dollars in cash and um, uh, at the end of the day, if we don't get this X party and I have to give notice, there will not be any cash in there. And the other spouse will say, I don't know what you're talking about, cash. There's never been any cash. So that's one of the things you would want to try and do. Uh, it's also applicable, as you'll see, when we go further on to another one of the assets. And we're going to talk about the next item. Sure. And let me just echo what um, Ira just said. I think a lot of this, when you are educating the judge, is show us. You know, don't tell us. Don't tell us that the other side is being recalcitrant. Um, show us. And the very effective declarations that set forth what you've already done, what you've already tried, what the other party has failed to do, very effective um, when you can really delineate that. Also, we're here in a collections position. So right now we're talking about as long as you can show there's a judgment and this is one mechanism to enforce it, it might be different than if you're talking about at the beginning of a case and a court might be more willing to consider it. 
Um, so global text is another one of the assets that was uh, mentioned in the hypothetical. And so the, um, the it's an S corporation in California. So as long as um, it is licensed to do business within the state of California, then um, you can you can exercise uh, you can you can request the turnover orders for the stock certificate. Um, however, if it is a Panamanian company, well, well, I guess we have the three the three Panamanian companies are part of that. I'm sorry. So Global Techs is a California S corporation, so that would not be a problem. Um, in terms of the different entities that are Panamanian. For them, you have to see whether or not they're licensed to do business within the state of California. So as long as they are, then the court has jurisdiction to make a, an order over them as a, a turnover order. And if they're not licensed in California? If they're not, you have much more of a headache. Um, there is a treaty, the Hague Convention, for um, recognition of foreign judgments, but there's very few signatories to that. So I think this is the tricky part of this hypothetical. You do have to hire an expert in foreign law and get an attorney over in the, com the country at question and try to uh, levy there. Now, I was asking Ira, have you ever successfully been able to get at uh, a corporation overseas or an account overseas? And he said... No. I, I should qualify that. I've never been able to do it with, an, with a California judgment. If the um, California judgment was domesticated in a foreign country, then it would be a different answer. And actually, it was a pension plan in Italy, uh, and there's no ex there's no exemption in Italy for pension plans. So, whatever was in the pension plan when they got the uh, California judgment domesticated in Italy, we were able to get to it. So the same question with the uh, bank accounts. Um, if those are banks that are licensed to do business in California, then you can get a judgment here and then. You've got personal jurisdiction. If not, you have to go to those different uh, countries and see whether or not you can get um, get those that money loose. Next, we're going to turn to the 65 GT40. Uh, a couple of things to take into account about the car. First of all, it's in Rex's father's name. So presumably, you're only going to have a judgment against Rex. So that brings up, there's a, here are the hurdles you're going to face. One, in order to get to it, you're probably going to have to file a motion for joinder uh, pursuant to California Rule of Court 524EB2. Um, because if you can get joinder, then you can get uh, jurisdiction over Rex's father. Uh, a few caveats as to the joinder. First of all, if the motion is granted, the third party here uh, and you have to, would have the right to file 170.6. So think about it. If you're getting, if you're doing very well in front of a particular judicial officer, the, the first thing Rex's father is going to do is file 170.6, and you'll get sent somewhere else. And, and quite frankly, if you add a number of parties, which sometimes happens where you add, add, add not in this situation, but where you add LLCs, LLPs as, as parties, each of them has a, a, a right to a 170.6. Um, if the motion is granted, a couple other points. One, um, Rex's father may be entitled to a jury trial if the causes of action are for legal causes of action versus equitable causes of action. And when a, when a party is joined, a proposed complaint is deemed filed. The, a lot of times I've seen the complaint, it's basically one long declaration. That's not what the complaint has to be. If you remember back in the day when you were in law school and you discussed civil causes of action, uh, that's exactly what you have to do. You have to allege a cause of action that will sound civilly, such as breach of contract, fraud, and here's another hoop that you have to jump through. Those, those complaints are subject to demurs, motions to strike, and summary judgment. So these are the hoops you're gonna have to overcome with the car. Let's assume for a minute all those are those hoops are gone. Then you have the you have to determine whether it's going to be cost effective to, to do anything with the car. The 
<clears throat> you need to get an idea since this is a 65 Ford, and I think this was discussed earlier, uh, that, hey, we've never heard of a 65 Ford being worth much of anything until you look up and what it's worth. And for purposes of getting a, a fix on it, you probably can go to the internet and find a website that'll give you at least some idea of the value. You don't have to have the exact amount, but you need to have some idea what it's worth. And then here are the other things to take into consideration. The sheriff charges, I think it's $1,500 as a deposit. And then pursuant to CCP 704010, the owner is entitled to $2,300 right off the top as an exemption. They don't have to file anything. So now you're in $3,800. So the car you're going to try and sell better be worth a lot more. Uh, or you're just spinning your wheels on it. And if you've ever been to one of these auctions of cars, the same people show up uh, with a series of cashier's checks. They know exactly what the car is worth. And it's, it, you know, they're not going to, you're not going to make a lot of money on it. But then again, if it's a car like this, which I understand is worth a considerable amount of money, uh, and you're able to finally sell it, it may be worthwhile. Um, the other <clears throat> next item we're going to discuss is the large grocery store and store gift cards. This is sort of a variation on people buying cashier's uh, money orders or cashier's checks or full price airline tickets, which is basically worth, you can sell those too or sell them back. So this would also require a uh, RFO motion for a turnover order that would be turned over to uh, the sheriff. So those are, those are the assets that were part of the hypothetical. Uh, and I think we're going to go into the various forms of enforcement. We're going to start off with the wage gar garnishment or assignment. There's, there's two different ways, an, an earnings withholding order if the person is employed in a garnishment if it's contract labor. And here's the surprise, you can levy on Social Security for child support or spousal support, but not for attorney's fees. Uh, getting the order in place is the biggest work you'll be doing, but once it's in place, not only is it in place and there's no problems, you can actually get it, the money paid electronically to your client or whoever is going to get the money. Uh, and then every month it gets paid.